this is something that started a long time ago, and we're just now getting around to uh, presenting it to the congregation. This was an idea that Sean Larson had, uh, like I said, a long time ago. And um, uh, he brought it to the elders, and we talked about it and prayed about it and stuff like that, and had, you know, thought it was a really good idea, something we wanted to share with the congregation. Um, and, and then we, it just didn't happen <laughs> for like a really long time. And today I told Sean, I said, I, I want that, or yesterday, I said, I want to talk about that tomorrow because it goes along really well with last week's message. And he showed up this morning and said, I'm not shaking your hand. And I thought, oh, no, he's mad at me. I did play a prank on him, but uh, he wasn't mad at me about that. He, he had caught in a cold and, uh, and didn't want to, he said, I, I don't want to be here. I don't want to catch, you know, give this to anybody else. So I'm going to talk about it and just get it over with. And then later down the road, he'll share more about his heart. But this is called a ministry jar. And what it is, there's not very many in here right now. We'll increase it as we go. But you notice there's little pieces of paper in here. And each of these pieces of paper have on it a task. This one says, find someone in the church that you know is struggling and let them know how much they are loved and are being prayed for. Okay, and then there's other stuff in here like, you know, uh, take someone out to lunch that you don't know or, you know, uh, go uh, take food to somebody or I don't know, there's a bunch in there. So, And then we're going to add to it as we go, as we get new ideas on way to minister to people. But the reason for this, the reason that this came up Sean was having a conversation with an individual in the church, and, and uh, uh, they just kept saying, you know, I just, I wish there was more I could do. I want to be more involved. And he said, you know, there's a disconnect between our desire to live out our faith in Christ and the practical application. Because people, we don't know how to minister. And so when we say, go and minister to someone, we go, oh, I don't even know what that means. You know, how do I do that? And it's very simple. It's like what we talked about last week. Just love somebody. It's real simple. Show someone that you love them in a very practical way. Show them that you love them in a way that would make you feel loved. Uh, and, then, and then just do it. And that sort of activity, as we walk in those things, we will grow in our ministry, both to the church. I think a lot of these are too... Well, I don't know about a lot of them. I really don't remember what was on the list. But there's some that are for church people, and there are some that can be applied to anyone. And I want to encourage you, you know, as we, excuse me, as we talked about last week, how Jesus loved sinners and that he always sought out sinners. Do that. When you pull something out there and it says, you know, go take somebody food, don't go take it to somebody in the church that you know can pay you back, like Jesus said. Go out and find someone that can never pay you back. Someone that would never expect to see you. And hand them the food and say, I love you and God loves you. And there you go and... Give me the dish back. If <laughs> you need the dish back, uh, actually give them a dish because then that gives you an excuse to go back and get it later and, and strike up another conversation. But you know, love them without any conditions, love them without any expectations, and love them without an agenda. Just love them the way Jesus did. And this is a good way to just a practical way just to give you ideas. Now, if the question was asked, what if we draw something we're not comfortable with or can't do? Put it back and get another one. <laughs> okay, but what we encourage you guys to do is to pray about this before you pull one out and say, God, give me something that I need to do. Pull it out, and if you're not comfortable doing it, do it anyway. Now, if it's mow the lawn and you're 80 years old and shouldn't be out mowing nobody's lawn, then please don't do it, okay? Put it back and find something else. But, uh, yes, what's that? That's a good point. I, yeah, I never really thought about that. Yeah, if you can find a kid that's willing to do it. <laughs> uh, yeah, we got a couple right here that are willing to do it. Give them a call. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's a good point. But you know, uh, we need to, as Christians, we need to walk as Jesus walked. And Jesus told his disciples on the day that he died that I made my, I'm the boss, I'm the man, I'm the teacher. I'm the master, and yet I made myself a servant for you. Now go and do likewise. So we need to serve other people. And this is a nice practical way to give you ideas. Now this is not, you know, I'm not going to ask everybody in the church to take something out of there. This is going to be spirit-led. If you feel God's leading you to do it, do it. And if you don't, then don't. But if, he's, if you feel a tug on your heart to do it, do it. Okay? Don't let fear hold you back. Don't let expectations hold you back. Don't let schedule hold you back because there's nothing in this world more important than serving God, right? 
Serving God? Well, how do you serve God? You serve other people. So, this is going to be on the back table. It's going to be its new home. Uh, we got a jar big enough that you should be able to get, even, even you big guys can get your hands in there and out. The first jar, we were a little concerned <laughs> that you couldn't get your hands back out. And then if you have an idea, like if, um, if there's something that you want added to that list, uh, let me know or one of the other elders, and we'll put it in there. The, a question was asked whether or not you can put people's names in there that need assistance. Our recommendation is if you know someone that needs assistance and hasn't requested it, please let me or one of the elders know. And then if you draw something out of there and you, you know, give some, someone who's needy, you can come ask us who that is. That way the information isn't uh, public. It's, you know, we try to keep that as, as private as we can for the, for the um, respect of the people that have needs. So any questions about that? Not too complicated? Okay, all right, good, good. Um, oh, one other thing. Please put it back. <laughs> Don't draw it out and keep it because we'll just have to make them again. So if you draw it out, just throw it back in and someone else can draw it later. All right. Open up your Bibles to Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14. We're going to have uh, four main scriptures again this week. Uh, Luke 14 will be our first one. We are studying the life of Jesus, trying to get him know be- trying to get to know him better by asking the questions, who is he, what does he do, and what does he want? Now, last week, Jesus connected with sinners. Okay, Last week, he sought out people of bad reputation, people of bad behavior, and ministered to them. Ministered to them through truth, through healing, uh, through forgiveness, all sorts of things. But let's get back to the crowd today, okay? Jesus dealing with crowds. Now, when he was with the crowds, he usually healed people, drove out demons, and taught. And a lot of what Jesus had to say was very encouraging. You know, Jesus did a lot of encouraging uh, to people. And that's one of the reasons why people like to listen to him, why people flock to him. Because he loved them, and he encouraged them, and he told them the good news about the kingdom of God. But not everything Jesus said was fluffy bunnies. Okay? You guys ever heard that phrase before? It's kind of like peachy king. I prefer fluffy bunnies to peachy king. I've never had Peachy King. I don't know what it is, but I know what fluffy bunnies are. So Jesus didn't always say things that were easy to swallow. Didn't always say things that were pleasant. And he spent some of his time confronting people. But we're going to save that until next week. This week, instead, I don't want to look at Jesus' confrontation with uh, individuals as much as I want to look at Jesus' warning for his disciples. Because the confrontation that Jesus had was generally reserved for those outside the kingdom. And it was generally for those that were too high-minded for the kingdom. Those who were too proud, thought too much of themselves to humble themselves to be in the kingdom. But these are warnings that Jesus gave to his disciples. So this is for us today. Now, there were a bunch that I had to take out for time reason. But we're going to look at four main ones because they still apply for us today. Like, like for example, Jesus warned his disciples that he was going to die that he was going to be raised from the dead. He warned Jerusalem that it was going to be destroyed. And those things have already happened. But some of his warnings still apply for us today. So let's look at Luke chapter 14, starting in verse 25. Verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began began to build but wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation, while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. What's Jesus talking about here? He's warning people that there's a cost to being in the kingdom of God. You ever had a phone call or someone come talk to you about a business venture or some idea? What do Kansans always want to know up front? What's it going to cost? Tell me that up front. Don't tell me that at the end after you've hooked line and no. After you've hooked me in, 
Tell me that at the end, or tell me that at the beginning. What's it going to cost? And Jesus is telling people, look, being my disciple is great because the kingdom of God is powerful and it's successful and there's eternal life after and it's intimacy with the Father and it's great. But it costs something. There's a catch. (laughs) And it's not much. It's just all of you. Some of you caught that. That was an underhanded insult. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you didn't. I don't know. Some of you smiled. That was a slight dig at the human race. Now, look at what Jesus says here. You have to hate your father and mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, you have to hate even your own life. Now, no, you don't have to hate your family because God tells us to love our family. What he means is you have to love me so much that in comparison, the love for your family looks like hatred. Kind of like, uh, well, now we won't go there. You guys understand what I'm talking about, right? Okay, we're just going to keep moving then. And then in verse 27, And whoever does not carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, the cross was not a Jewish thing. We, We often equate crosses with Jerusalem because that's the most famous one. But crosses were a Roman thing. In fact, the Jews couldn't even whip their whip people that were guilty with 40 lashes lest the person be degraded in their eyes. So crucifixion was a horrible, gruesome, foreign thing. Kind of like, um, you remember when, a long time ago, when that kid got caned in Japan? You remember that story and everyone was freaking out about this poor, poor kid who was going to have his butt beaten with a bamboo cane and we thought, that's cruel and unusual. But they were, what's the big deal? Everyone gets caned. I mean, he broke the law, he gets caned. But for us, it was foreign. It's kind of like that, only more extreme, where they're, you know, Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. It would have had a sour taste in your mouth when he said that. It would have felt awkward. In fact, the word caning today is used in all sorts of jokes as an over-the-top punishment for something trivial. And this probably would have been similar, an over-the-top punishment, because the Romans would crucify people for just about nothing. And he, yet he told them, Pick up your cross every day and follow me. Now, I know a little bit about crowds, and I know a little bit about sociology, and I've studied, you know, movements in the past and great teachers and leaders and horrible teachers and leaders. And, you know, I know a little bit about how to draw a crowd and how to keep a crowd. This isn't it. If you want people to keep following you, you give them fluffy bunnies. You don't hand them, you're going to have to crucify yourself every day. It's kind of like when Jesus said, if you want to be my disciple, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. What happened after that? Everybody left. Because that, that's sick, Jesus. What is wrong with you? And so here's Jesus t- warning them that there's a cost. And the cost is you. You have to give up you to be a part of the kingdom of God. Now, I want to be very careful here that you do not misunderstand. I do not mean that you stop being who you are, because God loves who you are. He made you who you are, and He wants you to be that. But He wants you to put Him above yourself. And really, the only way to do that is for us to crucify ourself, because self is a pretty loud thing, isn't it? Our flesh can get our attention so fast. The other day I was... um, I was getting hungry. Actually, well, it was yesterday. I was getting hungry about 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I thought, well, that's not good. <laughs> you know, uh, there's a long time till supper. And, and my mind started thinking about all these like, images of food started showing up. And I was like, oh, that'd be good. It ended up working out because I made it a delicious dish that night for supper, invented something new, and it was awesome. But, but that idea, our, our, our mind was, will, will take over and start telling us what to do. The only way to truly let Christ be first is to crucify self. Okay, so that's what Jesus is telling us. So there's a cost. Jesus warns us that there is a cost of accepting him and being a part of his kingdom. Go to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Let's see another warning that Jesus gave us, and you'll see how they all connect at the end. So Jesus warns us that there's a cost. In fact, there's a... uh, a uh, line in Luke chapter 16, verse 13, where Jesus is teaching the people, and he says, you cannot serve both God and money. In other words, you can't serve God and something else. And in America, we love serving self, don't we? I mean, we've even got self-serve ice cream. Of all the things that you shouldn't be able to serve yourself, ice cream should not be in that category. 
Those places where you like, you put it in the thing yourself and then they wait, that's a trap. <laughs> and they give you this giant bowl. I took tears of there one time. We had to share one because as we got done, I was like, this is too much for one of us. Anyway, sorry. Off subject. Matthew chapter 24. Let's start in verse 9. Jesus is warning his disciples. He says, then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. What is Jesus warning his disciples now? Look, it's not just going to cost you yourself. There's going to be costs coming in from the outside too. You don't just crucify yourself. Other people are going to crucify you too if you're my disciple. What did Jesus say? No, no servant is greater than his master. If they called the master the son or, the, or the, the king of demons, what are they going to call his servants? He's warning us that, look, the way I was treated is the way you're going to be treated. People are going to do what? They're going to hate you. They're going to persecute you. They're going to put you to death. Now, this is, of course, a side note and not exactly what we're talking about today, but I've always asked this question. Every time I run across Jesus' promises, of persecution, I always have to ask, why don't we see that? How come I'm not being persecuted for my faith? How come people don't hate me? How come no one's trying to string me up? Now, of course, we live in a free country, that's a lot of it, but if our faith never makes us uncomfortable, might we be, might we be doing something wrong? Just a thought. What else is going to go wrong? Many will turn away and will betray and hate each other, your own family. Your own fellow believers are going to betray each other when this time comes. False prophets will appear and deceive many people. That's, many of that's already happened. And because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Jesus is warning us that not only are we going to have to give up ourselves, other people are going to attack us for the faith. It's not going to all be fluffy bunnies. Bad things are going to happen because you love Jesus. That's part of the deal, okay? Now, go to John. I know I'm making you turn all over the place. Go to John chapter 15. We're actually going to go back to Matthew, so if you want to keep your finger there, you can. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. So Jesus warns us that there's going to be a cost, both from the inside and from the outside. Now, let's look and see what other warnings he gives us. Let's see, let's read through verse 8. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What's Jesus' warning here? We need to abide. We need to abide in Jesus. Now, we don't often look at this section as a warning, but look in verse 5, no, 6. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. What does that mean, thrown into the fire and burned? Well, we don't know for, sure, for certain, but Jesus used that metaphor a lot for hell. So if you don't remain in Jesus, you can wither up and be thrown into the fire. I don't know about you, I don't want to end up in the fire. I want to be one of those that remains in Jesus until he comes back and then just remain in him in eternal life forever too. But what do I have to do for that? Well, the first answer most people give is you have to bear fruit. But they misunderstand the way it's worded because bearing fruit is listed first. But notice how you bear fruit. You remain in Him. In fact, if you look at verse 6, it says, If you do not remain in Me, then you will be thrown into the fire. 
So the fruit is the natural result of abiding in the vine. So what does it mean to abide in Jesus then? That phrase means to permanently dwell with. In other words, you need to move in with him. You need to move in with Jesus. You need to make wherever he is your home. And really the truth is, he makes his home in you. But we need to keep that intimate relationship with him. We need to keep that constant contact with him. And I've known many people in my life, and I'm, I haven't been around that long, but I've known many people in my life that had a relationship with Jesus and didn't abide. They didn't do anything to help them stay connected with Jesus because I don't know, um, I don't know, does it work in small lakes where if you t- untie a boat, it'll drift out to the middle? Does that work in small lakes too or just in, okay. I thought it did, but I couldn't remember. You know, if we don't stay tethered to Jesus, we will wander off. Because that's our flesh. That's what we do. And there's a lot of people out there that think, well, I don't need church. I don't need Bible study. I don't need fellowship. I don't need accountability because I've got God. And folks, I was one of those people. So please don't take offense if you're one of those people. I used to be too. And God keeps reminding me over and over again, you need connection. Because as you stay connected with people, you will stay connected with me. And if you stay connected with me, you will bear much fruit and you will not be thrown into the fire. I want to say the opposite of abiding, because that word abide is really important. It's used several times in the the book of John. But that word for abide, the opposite could be translated drifting away. Where our the presence of God in our heart and mind diminishes to the point where it's no longer there. Now, I don't know what you guys are like, but if I come up with a decision or a a question that needs an answer or, you know, something that needs a decision, my first instinct is to ask, what would Jesus do? What would God do? What would be his opinion on this subject? If I don't know, then I'll think about it a little longer. If I still don't know, I'll try to find it in the Bible. And if I still don't know, then I'll pray and say, God, tell me, I got no clue on this one. But very rarely will I make an important decision without taking it to God first. Of course, I probably ought to pray first instead of trying to use my own reason. But he's first when I think of stuff. When I wake up in the morning, God is the first thing on my mind, usually. On Monday, he's not. <laughs> That's my day off, for those of you who don't know. Monday's my Saturday. I wake up on Monday, and it's like, Ugh. there's nothing on my mind on Mondays. But I try to keep Jesus on the forefront of my thoughts, on the forefront of my heart. Because if I don't, I've seen what happens in my own life. I've watched myself drift away from God like a boat untethered to the shore until I'm in the middle and there's no way I can get back to safety. Now, God is good. He can always bring us back. His arm is mighty to save and there's no place He he can't reach. But we need to be careful because once we get to that place, what happens to our desires for God? We don't care anymore. We're not thinking about Him. So we rarely cry out to him and say, Lord, save me. Go to Matthew chapter 16. Let's do one more. Matthew, that would be the first gospel. Verse 5. One more warning. So Jesus warns us that it's going to cost us ourselves. He warns us that it's going to be dangerous and that we will there will be pain involved in being his disciples. Then he warns us to abide in him, and here's one more. Verse 5, when they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. They discussed this amongst themselves and said, it is because we didn't bring any bread. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, are you, Oh, you of little faith, why are you talking amongst yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the 5,000 or ha- and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the 4,000 and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? But be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread, but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Now, that's a a warning from Jesus to watch out for the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And that always drove me crazy because I didn't know what that meant. (laughs) I didn't know what the Pharisees taught and what the Sadducees taught. And so I did some research today. You're going to get a very small slice of the research. Maybe you'll get some more later. But uh, it was interesting what 
the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees taught that was in contradiction to what Jesus taught. First of all, let's look at the Pharisees. The Pharisees are more well-known, mostly because they're referred to more in Scripture, but also their sect lasted a much longer time. The Sadducees weren't around for very long, maybe 100 years. And when Jerusalem fell in AD 70, or 70 AD, uh, that was the end of their group, and they never recovered from that. The Pharisees lasted on past that. They were long before then. So we know a lot more about the Pharisees. The Pharisees loved to add to the law. Now, the law was the first five books of the Bible, and the Pharisees loved to give what, they, what the Bible refers to as oral traditions, or the traditions of men. They would read it and say, oh, this is what it, what it means, and then they would expound on it, and people had to follow that. For example, Jesus ran into this when um, they uh, asked Jesus why his disciples weren't washing their hands before they ate. That was an oral tradition passed down by the Pharisees. Okay? Uh, another one is uh, all their Sabbath rules. That's why the Pharisees were so mad at Jesus for breaking the Sabbath, because they had all these ridiculous rules. My favorite is you can't, you can't go like, let's say, 10 yards or 40 yards past your house. Okay, There was a limit. I don't know how big it was, but you couldn't, go, you couldn't leave your house any farther than that. But if you tied a rope to your house and brought it with you, you could go 40 yards past the end of the rope. Yeah. That's the kind of ridiculous stuff that these guys came up with because they wanted to follow God. They had good intentions. They weren't bad people. They just, you know, they kept adding to the law. And Jesus didn't follow their additions, and it irritated the tar out of them. Why? Because once you start changing the law of God, you see yourself as superior and in control of it. So once you start saying, I know the Bible doesn't say this exactly, but I know this is what it means, and you better follow what I have to say, suddenly you, I can do this with it too, and I can do this with it too, and this with it too, and next thing you know, you're judging everybody around you because nobody is as good as you are. That's what happened to the Pharisees. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus was always telling them how bad they were. Because they didn't have a clue. They thought they were great people. They were the most pious people on the planet, but they had missed it because they had started dabbling in changing the law. Okay? For the Pharisees, it was all about performance, and they had missed the heart of God, that of love. Now, what about the Sadducees? The Sadducees, in my opinion, rejected the power of God. We don't know a whole lot about the Sadducees, but we do know that they rejected the resurrection. They believed that once you died, you died. And that's why they were sad, you see? Yeah, yeah, come on now. I didn't make that one up. I heard it somewhere. <laughs> it's a terrible, terrible joke. I can't believe I said it. But uh, 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 one reference in Scripture suggests that they didn't believe in angels or spiritual beings and that kind of stuff. We're not really sure about that because, like I said, we don't know much about them. But here's something interesting that we do know about the Sadducees. They were mostly rich and influential these were the ruling, aristocratic, educated elite of the Jewish culture. Now, elitist culture has a bad habit of becoming insulated, where their thoughts start to inbreed with each other, <laughs> and then they start to mutate and become weird, crazy things. The same thing happened in the church during the 17 and 1800s in what was called the higher criticism movement where people began to use reason to criticize the Bible. They had put themselves above the Bible. What's interesting is that the Sadducees were actually a very conservative group. They rejected all the Pharisees' oral additions to the Scripture and wanted to stick just with the Scripture. But they also rejected a lot in the Scripture because it talks about the resurrection of the dead in the Old Testament. So they had to handpick their stuff. They were just like the higher critics. Now, if you're not familiar with the higher critics movement in that, that time period, uh, they were also very educated. Knowledge puffs up, remember? They were very wealthy, so they thought they were the wisest people on the planet, and so they kind of scoffed at those foolish people who actually believed in supernatural stuff. Uh, boy, were they surprised when Jesus rose from the dead <laughs> and went around healing people. And so they ended up limiting the, fate or the, the reward of life to this life only, which is one of the reasons why they sought wealth. Okay, now Jesus warned against the teachings of, the, of both of them because they both fall in ditches on either side of the truth. The Pharisees rejected love. Uh, they rejected 
uh, grace in favor for performance and ended up becoming judgmental. The Sadducees had gone off on the, under, on the other side and rejected some of the truth in Scripture and rejected the power of God and ended up being judgmental of people. Whereas Jesus was walking down the middle loving sinners, there's no, there's no surprise He wasn't the most popular of the Messiahs of His day. And yes, I say that intentionally because there were a lot of people claiming to be the Messiah. All right, so who was Jesus? There's one metaphorical reference. Did anybody catch it? Well, one that I caught. The vine. Jesus is identified as the vine, the source, okay? But what I want to call him today is Jesus is the whistleblower. He's the one that tells his trouble's coming. He's the Paul Revere saying, the British are coming. Trouble is coming. Now, why does Jesus warn us about all these things? Well, let me just give you a possible answer to that. Jesus wants you to succeed. He wants you to win. But to win, you have to play by the rules. Does that sound familiar? Remember we talked about how Jesus wanted to succeed himself in what he was doing, but in order to do that, he had to play by the rules? Jesus wants you to win, and so he warns you of the pitfalls ahead. Anybody just really hate needles like me? Any other needle haters? Yeah, hate needles. You work in a hospital. <laughs> I, I, I love it when the doctor, when they're given the flu shot, they'll like pinch your skin, right, so that you can't feel the needle, and they'll say, you're going to feel a little sting. I like that, because I can prepare myself not to pass out when the needle goes in. I'm ridiculous. It's really pitiful. Uh, I like the warning, because then I can prepare myself and hopefully survive whatever it was they were going to do to me. So far, it's been okay. When we know the pitfalls ahead, we can navigate around them. So let's look at some of these pitfalls. First of all, counting the cost. If you didn't know that you needed to sacrifice yourself daily to be a disciple of Christ, then when you accepted Him and suddenly you ran into trouble and Jesus asked you to give up something, you would say, well, that wasn't part of the deal. You're trying to trick me. And then we'd walk away. Or what if, what if we were one of those individuals that accepted Christ thinking He would make our life better and people start attacking us because of it? What would happen if we weren't prepared for that? We would say, well, this isn't what I signed up for. People are going to treat me like this. I'm just going to leave this whole stuff aside. If we weren't prepared with abiding in the vine, if He didn't warn us that we needed to abide in Him to bear fruit and fruit to stay in the kingdom, we would have just said, yay, I'm forgiven, I'm saved, and just wandered off and left Jesus there and gotten so far away we never even think to come back. What happens if Jesus didn't warn us about the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees? We would have ended up being led astray into those very common problems. Now, you don't think they're common. I want you to take a good hard look at the church, the American church. Both sides exist in spades. You've got the judgmental legalistic people on one side and the liberal anything goes on the other. That's the Sadducees and the Pharisees. Because people weren't heeding the warnings of Jesus. Jesus wants us to win. He wants us to be successful in this battle of life. So we need to listen carefully to what He warns us to do. But the point today is this. Jesus cares about what happens to you in this struggle. Okay, And He has given you every weapon there is. He has given you every authority there is, and He's even given you every warning that you need to successfully navigate it. The problem, the reason Christians fall away today is not because Christ didn't prepare us, it's because we didn't take His preparation seriously. You remember that one in Matthew chapter 24 was talking about the last days and people are going to persecute you and hate you and, and betray you and all that kind of stuff? I think we're getting real close to that. Are you going to be able to survive when that happens? Are you going to be able to hold your head up high and say, you know what, I can handle this because I'm following the warnings of my king. He told me what was going to happen and now I'm prepared. I want you guys to know that Jesus loves you very much and he did a lot to prepare you. Don't waste it. Take advantage of it. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you for Jesus and all the wisdom that he gave us through your word. And Father, I pray that through the Holy Spirit we would understand what he has to say and apply it to our lives. 
And Father, help us to remember and be grateful to Jesus for all of the warnings He gave us about this life, that He didn't hide anything from us, that what was whispered in the, in the dark room was shouted from the rooftops, that we could know the truth and all of it. Thank You that the Holy Spirit is there to fill in the gaps and remind us of everything that He said and to lead us into all truth. And Father, help us to stand firm on that truth and to be victorious in this battle. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.